Have you fallen down the cottage industry rabbit hole yet? Well, if not, buckle up, Alice, and click on over to the description in the show notes and sign up. Then you can get ready for the most fun induction into the cult of all things yarn and fiber. This will include, but not limited to, free yarn, free ebooks, patterns, coupons, and much more. You don't want to miss out. You are listening to Crime, Coffee, and Crafts, a podcast featuring two crafty besties who love true crime and a good cup of joe. Hey, amateur sleuths. I'm Kristen. And I'm Heidi. Welcome Welcome back. back. We are on part two of Israel Keys. Dose. And we're going to get, yeah, we're going to get right to it. There's no new coffee, no new craft, because this is episode 49 and a half but we are still drinking coffee (laughs) Kristen's still drinking coffee I've got mine right here it's a little cold yeah I noticed your mug is uh (laughs) still black (laughs) it didn't change colors um we are gonna go over the trigger warnings again though because there's a couple of new ones in this part so we've got kidnapping rape murder necrophilia and suicide Okay. Um, so we left off in part one with Israel Keys leaving Bill and Lorraine's car in a parking lot. He had their ATM card, but he decided never to use it because it would just be too risky. He left Vermont and went camping in New Hampshire, where he burned some of their belongings that he had taken. He then went to Maine to spend time with his brothers, and he had the time of his life. Hmm. Yeah. On his way back from his little vacation with his family, he went back through Vermont, of course, because he wanted to see how tortured the people of Essex, Vermont were after losing their neighbors. Or, gotcha. You know, he wanted to go and yeah. Like moonlight. What a, what a seriously sick thought. Out. So he even went as far as going into online forums to see people's comments and theories of what they think happened to Bill and Lorraine. He even commented on them himself. Oh, so disturbing. Yeah. So like I've said before, and I'll say it again, Israel Keys was the absolute most terrifying serial killer there ever was. So... At this point, we are getting to his last confirmed victim. And this is the one where he broke from his usual MO. Oh. Yeah. He was close to home for this one. He did not travel. Oh. Yes. And he, which, an urge he was and escalating. His, 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 yeah, his itch was escalating. Basically, like he could not contain it. He didn't use a rental car used his own truck he also didn't realize that there were cameras everywhere cctv is everywhere y'all yeah and Mm. the police later used all of this footage against him good february 1st 2012 18 year old samantha koenig was working her night shift at her job as a barista at a cute little coffee cart in anchorage called common grounds Oh, it was like cute. one of those cool little coffee places that's like on a trailer and you can kind of like drive in, walk up to the trailer and just order. It's like a food truck, but it's right. Truck. Yeah. Um, it was cold and snowing, of course, because it's February in Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> um, and her boyfriend was actually going to be there soon to pick her up. But when he arrived, she wouldn't be there. No. You see, as Samantha was finishing up for the night, a man wearing a balaclava walked up and ordered a coffee, which 
yes, to us, this seems weird, but it's really not that weird in Alaska when it's winter time because it's that cold that you have right. to protect your nose and your face skin yeah. from the cold. Um, frostbite is real. She turned to get his coffee, and as she turned back around, he pulled a gun on her and told her to turn all the lights off. He then made her turn around, placing her hands toward the window, and he zip-tied her hands together behind her back. He then jumped through the window, grabbed all of the cash from the till, and forced her to walk with him across the street into a Home Depot parking lot and into his truck at gunpoint. Mm. And nobody, did anybody see this? No, because it's late at night. Oh, jeez. And it's snowing really hard and people are focused on the road. Right. So not focused on everything else around. Exactly. But this badass girl tried to escape as they walked. Apparently there was a camera on the ground. Like he, he said that it was like a brand new like Canon camera or something like that. And he like bent down to grab it. And when he bent down, she broke away from him and started running with her hands still tied behind her back. Mm -hmm. But he tackled her and she didn't put up any more fight after that. They even had to wait at a red light to cross the street. And as they waited, a fucking cop car pulled up and was also waiting at the red light. And he said that he was really nervous that she would do something. I hate that she didn't. But, like, she was fucking scared for her life. Yeah. <sighs> so they get across the street to the parking lot. There were even people close to his truck talking, but she didn't make a sound. I feel awful for her family. Yeah. He didn't kill her immediately, though. Um, and at one point, he even brought her back to her work just to get her cell phone. Because, well, that's really weird well he wanted to send a fake text to samantha's boyfriend oh because he was going to be picking her up right right um after retrieving the cell phone israel took samantha back to his house and put her in a shed behind his house now keep in mind it's alaska it's winter it's it was 12 degrees that night Oof. fuck that 12 degrees with wind and snow no no no. i can't imagine like what feel what the feels like temperature was with the wind chill right probably like probably negative 15 probably so israel turned the music up really loud in the shed and he had heaters out there so that they would stay warm he was talking to samantha about money and she told him that she had an atm card but that it was in her boyfriend's truck Mm -hmm. this story is super weird now samantha's boyfriend showed up to her work that night to pick her up but he quickly noticed she wasn't there it was odd sort of to him but not super odd because they had actually been arguing and he just assumed that she had had someone else pick her up so she could have some time away from him he didn't really he didn't think that it was anything to really worry about right Later that night, he got a text from her phone saying, quote, F you, asshole. I know what you did. I'm going to spend a couple days with friends. Need time to think, plan, acting weird. Let my dad know. End quote. That oh, was, that, that was weird. Yeah. But the text was off. He knew something was off at this point. He didn't probably know because what. Everybody has a style. Yeah, everybody texting. has a texting style. Yep, and this was not hers. Not in her usual texting style at all. Samantha, her boyfriend, and her dad all lived together in the same house. So her boyfriend told her dad, and they just waited, and nothing. There was just mm -hmm. nothing. Samantha never came home again. Late that night, Samantha's boyfriend heard a noise outside the house. So, of course, he went out to look probably a little bit on alert since Samantha took off and he got that weird text. He looked out front and some dude was rummaging around in his truck. Uh-huh. After 
Israel saw him, he just closed the truck door and calmly walked away. Oh my, wow. Uh-huh, he's fucking bold. And for some reason, sadly, the boyfriend didn't connect anything at that moment. Um, he did go and check out his truck and didn't see anything missing. So he just didn't do anything. I personally would have called the cops immediately because like, what the fuck? Yeah. You just but, found someone rummaging through your yeah. personal stuff and in your truck. Yeah. Israel was successful in getting Samantha's ATM card, but he didn't have the pin. So he had to go back home mm. to the shed. He got the pin number from her, etched it onto the front of the card, which he did before. Yes, he has. Um, he went out and tried to use the card Quickly learning that there was less than one dollar on it. Oh no. So he had to wait. Um, Israel went back to the shed where he untied Samantha for a little bit, but then he tied her back up again. He raped Samantha twice and then he strangled her and stabbed her to death. Mm. After cleaning up, he hid her body in a tarp inside the shed while he went on a planned vacation with his family <laughs> yeah what uh-huh like a two-week vacation but it's winter wow. in alaska it's fucking cold yeah. he turned the heaters off in the shed leaving samantha's body to freeze yeah mm -hmm. when israel returned from his vacation he went out to his shed and it's y'all Seriously, I hope you're not eating right now. Put the pepperoni away, Kristen. <laughs> she, was, she was eating. <laughs> Don't eat it right now because it's going to gross you out. <laughs> All right. I just ate a piece. I warned you. <laughs> he went out to his shed and stitched Samantha's eyes open with fishing line to make her look alive. Her body was so frozen that he couldn't pose it, though. Yeah, I mean. So Israel realized he needed to thaw Samantha's body out. So he strung oh, her up. Jeez. Yep. He strung her up inside the shed so she would be fully encircled by warm air. He turned the heaters on as high as they would go. And that's not even the disturbing part. Now, what started as just getting a ransom photo turned into something completely different. Apparently, this turned him on. She went Israel, from lifeless, cold to hot body? Hot body. Israel was apparently a necrophile. He raped her corpse for several hours. This is a couple-week-old body. I know she was frozen, but... It's basically fresh but yeah but yeah it's gonna decompose fast yeah but like don't listen to him talking about this because y'all you don't want to hear what he said about it because he's Disturbed. every interview when he's talking about this stuff he's real excited about it it's really gross mm. okay so he was raping her body for several hours before he heard a knock at the fucking shed door Mm. I have to say, thank all the gods that this door was locked because it was his 10 year old daughter at the door looking for her dad. Jeez oh, Louise. And nobody, no child needs to see this kind of shit. No, nobody. Needs no, to see nobody that. needs to see that. Not, not necessary. As he's telling this to the police. He's laughing about almost getting caught by his daughter as he was telling the police that he was raping a dead body. Because he is not He's human. Fucking disturbed. So he cleaned himself up, <clears throat> went to find a newspaper from the 13th of the month because that was when he was still out of town. Mm hmm. Um, 
When he came back, though, he saw that he needed to put makeup on her because her skin was gray. Yes, because she's fucking dead. Yeah. So he used the makeup from her purse, but that wasn't enough. So he had to resort to using his girlfriend's makeup, too. Oh, gosh. And she probably used it after. I know. I even put it in here. I can only hope he used it all. (laughs) <laughs> and put it back oh my god so fucking disturbing yeah so he finished her makeup and he actually did get his picture for the ransom note and she i mean it was off-putting for sure but like she looked alive it fooled everyone wow so it's now three weeks after the kidnapping and This dipshit took the photo he had taken of Samantha and a typed ransom note, made a photocopy with the photo on the ransom note, and hid them at a local park. Israel then sent Samantha's boyfriend a cryptic text with a message telling him where to find this clue and that Samantha was still alive. When her boyfriend retrieved the clue, he found the ransom note demanding $30,000 be deposited into Samantha's ATM card. It stated that Samantha would be released in six months if they followed his demands. It also Mm -hmm. said that they weren't even in Alaska anymore. It talked about the desert and some other places. He was basically just trying to throw the cops off. Yeah. So by this point in time, weather was changing. It was getting warmer. And the body was starting to stink. And he uh, hadn't yeah. gotten rid of it yet. His it's girlfriend not embalmed. He lived with his girlfriend and his 10-year-old daughter. His girlfriend had had a friend come visit for a week. <laughs> so like he just couldn't couldn't get rid of the body. Um he said it took him three separate trips to get rid of Samantha's body. He dismembered her before throwing her remains into Matanuska Lake. Um, so the ransom, the community actually banded together to raise money. Mm-hmm. All the while, this case is just fucking exploding all over the place. There's so much coverage. It's everywhere. Samantha's yeah. dad was holding press conferences, like random pop-up press conferences, begging for his daughter's release. And this, this was not the kind of publicity that Israel Keys wanted. Israel yeah. Keys, unlike a lot of other serial killer, killer killers, healers, healers, the serial killers, <laughs> he didn't want to be famous. He just wanted to kill. He liked right. going under the radar. That was his whole thing. He didn't want his kid to know. Yeah. The authorities spoke with Samantha's dad and told him to only put part of the ransom into Samantha's account, and he agreed. So he only deposited 5000 About four hours later, there was an attempted $600 ATM withdrawal, but that declined because there was a $500 limit. Um, in another couple hours, there was another one in Anchorage. These are local. Ding ding. Yeah. For five hundred dollars. And he actually got the money out. There were several more withdrawals in and around Anchorage. This was leading the police to know that like this guy actually knows his way around Anchorage. He's local. Right. So suddenly there's like no use on our card. And then all of a sudden, Wilcox, Arizona. That's the next ATM. Oh. That's far, far away. That is. And about an hour later in Lordsburg, New Mexico, leading officers to believe he was heading east on I-10 mm-hmm. towards Texas. Tight house. And every single ATM has CCTV installed, of course. But at every one, he hid his face and his body very well. But still, the authorities knew they were looking for an athletically built white male over six feet tall. Which, I mean, in that area is kind of common, but. Yeah. 
maybe. How tall did he end up being? Because we I talked no about idea. his six foot two when he was no teenager, clue. But... He was like fourteen. And he was already six foot two. So yeah, he was probably pretty tall. There was an APB to all states, including Texas, um, from Alaska. They weren't sure if they could find Samantha before it was too late, but damned if they weren't going to try. Yeah. So Israel was driving a white Ford Focus. They knew this because of the ATM footage. And this is unfortunately one of the most common car rentals <laughs> in the country. Yeah, it was probably, I mean, white, yeah, a yeah. lot of uh, business. Yes. Business I, workers. Yeah. So there was one Texas Ranger who was previously an officer and state trooper, but he heard this call out and he was like, I'm going to fucking find this guy, basically. Mm -hmm. So, thank goodness. Now, based on the withdrawals that had now happened in two different Texas towns, he knew the Alaska kidnapper was heading right toward him. Now, at this point, they don't know who the fuck his real keys is. They don't know... They think that this is just a kidnapping. Right. Nothing more. Um, at one point, he received an email stating that an officer had seen a white Ford Focus at an ATM still headed his way. So he put out a brand new APB of his own focusing on US 59, which would be the road that he was now on. Right. But they found nothing that night. But on March 13th, this Texas Ranger received a call from a detective saying he spotted a white Ford Focus at a hotel off Route 59. Mm. So the Texas Ranger takes off his cowboy hat, somewhat disguise himself from being law enforcement, and heads over to this hotel. He drove in his truck to the hotel. He realized he needed help and called in his lieutenant buddy to help work undercover. Nice. Which, like I'm like, fuck yeah, get him. The Ford Focus was still parked there. The Texas Ranger went inside to collect any sign-in info that he could get that may give him a clue as to who this guy is. But while he was inside, his friend who was keeping watch outside called him saying a man walked out of the room, out of a room, and began putting his belongings into the white Ford Focus. Mm -hmm. This could be the guy. He fit what they were looking for. Right. So the Texas Ranger told his friend to set up his car on US 59 as like a, I'm just going to pull people over kind of situation. Right. And he wants to potentially catch this guy. He tells his buddy to follow him like at a not super close distance, but follow him and pull him over for whatever he can, anything at all, whatever you can to pull this guy over. If he fucking goes one mile over the speed limit, if he just doesn't use his turn signal, whatever, do it. So at first, Israel is driving within the speed limits, using his turn signals, following every fucking rule there is. And then they're at a red light. The officer knows that past this red light, <laughs> the speed limit drops to 55. Oh. And he's hoping that this guy doesn't know it right and he was dead on israel took off from the red light hit 57 miles an hour boom israel keys got caught speeding that's that's what caught him yes so, and i'm gonna say <laughs> that that is what gets most people i fucking it's love it traffic stop yes so he pulls him over. He starts asking the driver questions and Israel was obviously anxious and stated that he was in town for a wedding. In the car, they found a lot, like a lot, a lot. <laughs> but the biggest piece of evidence they found was that damn ATM card. Yeah. In his wallet. So they arrested him. Other things that they found in his car, there was like cash just like in the back seat that had ink on it. Yeah. Clearly, clearly from a bank robbery. Right. Oh man. 
Okay. These officers really had no clue just how bad this guy was at the time they arrested him. Um, yeah, they just thought they were arresting a kidnapping suspect, not, not even close to the most prolific serial killer of all time. Mm. Like, ever. Ugh. So now they have their guy and the authorities in Alaska know where he lives because now they've got his name. Mm-hmm. And they went to his home, waited outside until they got their search warrant. Israel's white Chevy truck was parked outside and that truck was seen in the CCT footage at the time of the kidnapping from the coffee cart. Right. In the CCTV footage from the Home Depot parking lot. Nice. They saw him bring her back to that truck. Ooh. And put her inside. Yeah. <laughs> they knocked on the door, but nobody answered. They couldn't go in, but they could see through the windows. And they were kind of looking to see if they could see Samantha inside, tied up, maybe alive. Israel's girlfriend was actually the owner of the house. And she was working that night. Uh, the authorities spoke with her and she denied the fact that her boyfriend could ever be involved in anything like this. Of course not. He was, to his neighbors, the nicest man they knew. He was super helpful. Yeah. I cannot. Oh my God. It's so scary. (sighs) We now know that his daughter also lived with him and his girlfriend full time. Um, Which I really don't know what's worse living with your drug addict mom or your serial killer dad yeah who, that's who, um... but he was like trying to give her a normal life i'll give him credit for that but what the fuck bro monster okay so meanwhile in texas the interrogation isn't exactly going great israel doesn't want to talk about anything So the authorities deliver the shackled Israel keys to a federal penitentiary. And the next day, two Anchorage detectives arrived to speak with him. They showed him the ransom note that had been left at the park for Samantha's boyfriend. Israel tells them he can't help them. So they ask him about the ATM card that he had had in his possession. He says it's all a misunderstanding and that someone who owed him money in the construction business, had left a Ziploc bag in his vehicle with a cell phone and that ATM card with the pin number carved on the front of it. Mm -hmm. Likely story. This story was completely ridiculous and the cops knew it. So they asked him straight up if he knew anything about the kidnapping and he denied having any knowledge at all. Hmm. So... Israel's arraignment happened, and during the arraignment, outside the court, a detective noticed a tall, thin woman with long gray gray hair in a braid who looked almost Amish. His mother. His fucking mom. One detective introduced himself, and she responded that her name was Heidi. His mom came to his arraignment. Like, what the fuck? Jeez. The detective asked her if she knew anything about a girl being kidnapped, and her response was nothing short of creepy. You can see where Israel got some of his demeanor. Oh, yeah. I can't help you. If God wants that girl to be found, she'll be found. Mm. Holy shit. Jeez Louise. So by the end of March, Israel was extradited back to Anchorage. He agreed to talk, but he had some demands of his own. He needed his confessions to be kept quiet because he didn't want his daughter to know anything. He also agreed to tell the whole story about what happened to Samantha Koenig if they get him a cigar. Yes. He wanted a cigar. He was a cigar smoker, apparently. So the authorities agreed hesitantly. Obviously, because they're like, is he actually going to fucking do this? And right. they didn't They didn't want to keep this quiet. This was, they had no idea how huge this was about to be. Yeah. They needed him to confess to murder because they had zero proof of death. And if all they got was kidnapping charge, 
he's going to serve this much time when he should be put to death. Right. Yeah. The investigators asked Israel why he chose Samantha and whether he even knew her. His response was no, he'd never even seen her before. He chose her at that moment because that place was open late. Wrong time, wrong place. It could have been somebody else working that night. Right. He still would have done the same thing. He then proceeded to tell the investigators how it all happened. He had told Samantha that he had a police scanner in his ear and that he would know if the police were being dispatched to the coffee shop and that he would kill her. Inside the coffee shop, there was a panic button. She didn't have time to push it. Mm. Yeah. Now the cops are getting the full story that I told you before. And he even told the police where Samantha's remains were. And the police did recover her remains from the lake. So at least they got to have like a proper. Proper uh, lake and. Yeah. Funeral. Some kind closure. of. Closure. Some kind of closure, even though, holy shit, they got the details, I think, of this. I mean, they must know the details now. It's everywhere. Yeah. So. As they're interrogating him, they're also, they interrogated his mom. And they found out some more stuff from when Israel was recently on vacation. Mm, That family vacation. Yeah. The day Israel was supposed to fly back to Alaska with his daughter, he actually disappeared from his mom's house really early in the morning, like 2.30 in the morning. And she actually woke up and she like knew he left. Mm -hmm. they didn't see him for a couple of days what yeah when they finally found him he was completely disoriented in his rental car and the car was completely covered in mud so are we saying there was another murdered body we'll get there yeah his mom booked him a new flight but before that flight Israel disappeared again. Oh. Israel told the authorities that he had been driving around looking for an abandoned house and ATMs to grab his next victim. He said he planned to grab someone from an ATM and take them to the abandoned house, but that he also had a plan to kidnap someone and take them into a church where he would then rape them, torture, and murder them placing them on an altar for a priest to find. He thought this was funny. Dang, bro. He was was laughing as he's saying this. Ugh, so awful. He was looking around for the church to use and the victim he wanted to take. He found his potential victim, but decided against it because she had a huge dog and that went against his rules. No pets, no kids. Right. So... He told authorities that he decided it was too risky in Texas to dis- to kidnap anyone because everyone was armed. Yeah. So Israel decided, I'm going to rob a bank. Normally he would plan it out, but yeah, just go on a whim. Just go and take them out and get, yeah. get the and money. Apparently he had robbed several banks before. Um, not just the one in New York that he had actually told police about. Yeah. Um, And he was actually really good at it. He never got caught. He normally took his time and planned everything out, but this one was very different because he was on a high from killing Samantha. Right. And he felt invincible. Yeah. So Israel came up with the idea to create a diversion in this town so that all of the first responders would be at the other end of town, away mm-hmm. from the bank. Mm-hmm. So he drove around and found an old house, broke in, saw it was a hoarder house, which was already a fire hazard in itself. Lit it up. He found a thing of gasoline in the garage and he fucking burned the house. So after lighting the house on fire, he actually sat in his car and watched as first responders showed up to the house. And then he left and went to the bank. When he got to the bank, he parked his car 
and started smoking a cigar. And <laughs> he's just like hanging out in a parking lot smoking a cigar. He okay. Apparently looked really suspicious to this nosy neighbor because as he stood outside, she actually walked up to him and asked him who he was and what he was doing there. <laughs> <laughs> watch out for those small towns they know everyone and if they you are an outsider <laughs> they have a heavy dose of karens they see you <laughs> yes so she nothing came of it i guess but this didn't scare him away he went ahead and put on his disguise because he was always having disguises. Yes, yeah, and he headed into the bank, up to the teller, and walked out with an easy $10,000, which he said was the smallest amount he'd ever gotten during a bank robbery. Okay. So now, everything that Israel just told the authorities only made up for three of the four days that he was missing from his mom's house. Mm-hmm. So here's what the authorities have found and believe happened but it's alleged but i agree right so here we go the one day that was missing was the day before the robbery Mm -hmm. the day before the bank was robbed a man named jimmy tidwell went missing jimmy was a 58 year old hard-working electrician husband and father often working the night shift on this day, he got off work around 5.30 a.m. Oh. Never, never to be seen again. His truck was found a couple of days later, about five miles away from his house, with his glasses inside. Jimmy's keys, wallet, and phone were not in the truck. Jimmy couldn't see without his glasses. So, so why did he leave Something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing ever came of Jimmy's missing persons case because Israel never admitted to being involved. Hmm. But there's some seriously fucked up and very compelling evidence that leads me and everyone else to believe Jimmy was absolutely a Israel Keys, of Israel Keys, actual last victim. Hmm. Okay, so Jimmy had to wear a white hard hat to work. Hmm. It was not found with his belongings. Hmm. The disguise Israel wore to rob the bank the day after Jimmy, after Jimmy went missing, was a white hard hat. But it's so much worse than that. Sorry, guys. Hold on to everything you've got. Hold on to your butts. Israel had long hair under that hard hat, but he didn't have long hair. Jimmy did, though. Oh. Authorities had asked Israel if he wore a wig during the robbery. He said no. It is believed now that Israel scalped Jimmy Mm -hmm. and wore his scalp under his hard hat to rob the bank that day. And when investigators asked Israel, where do you buy real hair? Israel responded, quote, you don't have to buy real hair to get real hair. Hair is free. Everything is free if you take it. Yeah. Like what the actual fuck? Israel never admitted to the murder, though. He wouldn't talk further unless he got what he wanted. What Israel wanted was an execution date that was within the next year. He wanted to die. But the laws did not work that way. Yeah, if he couldn't, if he, right. I was going to say. It's just not the way it works. He wanted that because he could no longer do his work. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Israel still didn't want any of his case to be publicized, but eventually his identity was getting media attention. And this is when he basically stopped cooperating almost. Right. He didn't give any more information about anything because 
he was now known and his daughter probably yep. figured it out. So on May 23rd, 2012, Israel Keys attempted to escape. He used pencil shavings, not even kidding, like carving. Yeah. Know, using a, like a knife to carve a pencil uh, to pick his leg shackles <clears throat> and then faked them being locked by using his shoelace tied around his ankles, hmm. I guess, loosely. But his plan failed and the police ended up tasing him. So yeah. there's that. He got tased. <laughs> From that point on, he was double shackled on his ankles and he wasn't allowed pencils, nor was he allowed to have shoelaces. Only slip-ons, dude. Yeah. The he got slide. slippers. <laughs> oh, man. Authorities were having a difficult time getting info out of Israel, but he decided he would give them a big one this time. Israel told them he killed four people in Washington state, two on the west side and two on the east side. Two would have been back between July of 2001 to 2005. Okay. Two separate attacks. The other two, or no, that would have been, yes. The other two were killed separately in 2005 and 2006. He only went on to say he threw two of the bodies into Lake Crescent, but that's where he stopped. Mm. But the FBI did their digging and found a case that may fit the bill. July 11th, 2006, Mary Cooper and her daughter, Susanna Stodden, went for a hike on the Pinnacle Lake Trail. <clears throat> While they were there, they made friends with a husband and wife who were hiking the same trail. They were friendly and had good conversation, but when they came to a fork in the trail, two went left and the other two went right. So they just parted ways. Right. The husband and wife soon heard what sounded like gunshots in the distance. Hmm. But they continued hiking because the only way out is to finish the hike. <clears throat> and I'm just guessing that this was probably like a loop. Trail. Right. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the couple came across the bodies of their two new friends, Mary and Susanna. They had been shot with the 22. And there are definitely mixed opinions on whether or not these are victims it's of Israel. Victims. Yeah. Yeah, because he didn't use. <clears throat> yeah. So the big case regularly. that he gave them, he told them that he had killed Bill and Lorraine. Yeah. And where their bodies were. But we already talked about that case. Mm -hmm. Um. Unfortunately, we will never have more real answers without evidence because Israel completed suicide on December 2nd, 2012. He had somehow hid a razor blade from the guards, even though he was on suicide watch and was not supposed to have access to anything at all. Right. And how they had him on suicide watch wasn't like anybody like full time on him. They just had a sign on his fucking door that said no, no razor blades. What? the fuck you're supposed to do <clears throat> nope not at this one locks and check i mean they check every 15 him. minutes they weren't doing them every 15 apparently he had somehow mm. hid the razor blade and he slit his wrist and as an added measure of security he used his sheet to strangle himself by tying one end around his neck and the other to his feet behind his back. Oh, he hogtied himself? Yes. So that when his body relaxed from the blood loss after cutting his wrist, he would strangle himself. Right. Um, there was a suicide note found underneath his body, but it didn't contain any useful information. There were drawings in his blood found under his bed. Uh, these drawings were of 11 skulls and one pentagram and quote we are one end quote at the bottom of one drawing oh my yeah so the authorities actually think that the 11 skulls somehow correlate to his possible victims right i personally don't think that he only had 11 victims he probably had many more yeah 
So when the investigators started digging into Israel's travels more, because that's like, they start seeing like, he traveled a lot. Patterns of yes when he to, was killing. And, well, and like where missing persons happen. Like people go missing all the time. All the time. So scary. Uh, they were trying to find correlations between his travels and the missing persons cases. They actually found that he had traveled to Mexico for plastic surgery. And this is oh, just, that's a prime but place. Not, it's not what you're thinking, do. though. <laughs> not the kind of plastic surgery you'd think that he would have done. What they found out when they contacted the doctor's office was that Israel had actually had lap band surgery. Even though this dude's tall, skinny, like lanky dude. Yeah, why he was not overweight? The reason that they think. He did it was to make him more efficient as a hunter and killer. He didn't have to eat as much, basically. Right. So he would have more time to do what he needed to do. That's extreme. Very extreme. They did find another date that he went for plastic surgery, but we don't know why. They think that maybe it was to change his fingerprints. Mm. Um, He never changed anything on his appearance at all. Yeah. So Israel traveled to basically every state in the country, more to some than others. And And why did they ever say that he was traveling just to travel? I mean, I know he was doing it to kill. It was for construction. It was work. work. It was work related. That's a lot of travel for, I mean, going to every state. and Yeah, he traveled all the time. He could have killed everywhere he went. Yeah. Um, In fact, there's actually a woman who was almost a victim, she thinks, of Israel Keys. Um, She's mapping out possible victims of his, and she's writing a book. She probably already has finished the book at this point. The episode I saw with her, uh, she was driving. It was raining really hard. The truck pulled up behind her, was like on her ass. His headlights disappeared and she realized that he was so close to her car that she couldn't even see his headlights. Oh. And so she kind of like pulled off to the side and let him pass her. And then they kept driving and he actually slowed down suddenly and stopped completely. So she just went around him again. Right. Or no, he got out and was like waving her to, to his truck. That's what it was. She was getting waved to his truck and she wasn't thankfully like at that time she wasn't really like uh oh, people are bad you know but she still thank goodness split second she, decision she followed her gut guys she, and she fucking didn't stop drove around him and he followed her for a while longer and the description she gave of this guy was basically israel kids mm. so she's actually found um a possible missing persons case that could be attributed to Israel Keys. Mm -hmm. And Israel Keys was actually in the area when this person went missing. I guess he was running like a 5K or something in the area when this guy went missing. Interesting. Um, This man's name was Gilbert Gilman. His body may or may not have been disposed of in Lake Crescent in Washington, which is the lake that Israel said he threw a body in. Yeah. Is Israel Keys the most prolific serial killer in the world? Maybe. That's, I think so, personally. Maybe not as many kills, but not having a victim profile yeah, it definitely make made him yeah really scarier and harder to yeah. pinpoint and mm-hmm. match victims to each other. It's fucking disturbing. Yeah, that yeah. My yeah. brain, my brain hurts now. <laughs> oh, Ugh. yeah. Thank God that's over. Anyway, that is it. That's all I've got about Israel Keys. 
Hopefully uh, his daughter Hopefully. is happy and healthy somewhere. She is not in the media, which is good. Yeah. Um, I do hope that she is living a fulfilling life and is not haunted by her, her father. father. Yeah. I hope, I, that, hope so. I hope that he's stuck in purgatory. I really well, do. Yeah. I mean... If purgatory is real. He would be a prime example of okay, someone yeah. who could be because... He should be in hell with Harvey Keitel as the devil. <laughs> that was my reference to little Nikki. Yes. He should be getting the torture that Hitler got in little Nikki. Yes. Pineapple up his ass. I really like the idea of pulling out the fingernails. Yeah, that too. And oh, Kristen's yeah. favorite is the needles under. Yeah. And oh. screwdrivers and ears. Oh, God. <gasps> I've been having like some ear pain this last week. So that's really. Oh, yeah. That's triggering. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's all I got. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yuck. Doozy. That is a doozy. That hopefully, was a good one. Hopefully I did a good enough job. It was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah. You did you did really good. Ah, oh, thanks. All right. Until next time. Ta ta. For now. Thanks for listening to Crime Coffee and Crafts. If you love our podcast, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. This helps us more than you know. If you really love us and want to support us, go to our website at www.crimecoffeeandcrafts.com. From there, you can join our Patreon, shop our merch, and find us on social media.